I'm Alison Wolfe. I'm the Sir Roy Griffiths Professor of Public Sector Management at King's College London, and also, and more pertinently, the author of a recent monograph for the IEA on an adult approach to further education. For decades now, under both Conservative and Labour governments, we have had politicians I say labouring, delighting in the delusion that they can both plan the economy in the sense of knowing exactly what skills it will need and providing for them. And also, and this I think is even more striking, making policy with the unstated assumption that the only people who are able to make intelligent decisions about their own education and training are people with three A-levels. Neither of those positions, that politicians know what the skills are that the economy requires, or that only middle-class kids with three A-levels can make sensible decisions, stands up to any degree of scrutiny at all. But the result of those two assumptions is that we have created a wasteland where we should have a thriving system of further and adult education. In the monograph, I talk at some length about the gigantic waste of money that has resulted and itemise it. We are talking here about waste which runs at a conservative estimate at £2 billion a year, and that's year after year after year, spending money on things which are doing no good for anybody. What has been happening above all is that the government has convinced itself that everybody needs to get a formal qualification, that those qualifications can be designed centrally by government, that they can be churned out in enormous numbers with very little being spent on each one, and that somehow as a result of this the economy will thrive and individuals will get richer. Neither of these has happened. In fact, the government's own figures astonishingly show that many of the qualifications which they are forcing down, down people's throats are actually associated with lower incomes than if they hadn't done them at all. But the other thing that has happened in recent years is an even more extraordinary assumption, which is that not only can government decide what qualifications are important, but that it can and should subsidise companies to do their own in-house training. There is a certain amount of economic theory which you can put forward to argue this case, but actually absolutely no empirical evidence that if there are any market failures, they amount to a string of beans. But the result is that the British taxpayer is paying under something called train to gain for the initial training, in-house initial training, of some of the largest companies in the land. Now, I personally don't think that's an appropriate use of taxpayers' money. It's also an absolutely clear distortion because it's the biggest established companies that are benefiting and not the small companies and obviously not the companies of the future. So we're wasting vast amounts of money and in this monograph I detail why and detail where. But the problems go beyond that because it's not simply that we are wasting money on things that serve no good end. We have also squeezed out, abolished, decided that there is no point in providing any form of effectively general education, the sort of education that people want, to anybody except, again, middle-class kids who are going to do A-levels and then go on to do degrees. Everything else is meant to be tied to today's skill needs. Now, this is an extraordinary position. This is a country which once had and prided itself on having a truly developed adult education system. It was the pride of the Victorians. They poured huge amounts of money into it at a time when they were much poorer than us. And we have laid it waste. We have basically said that there is no good reason to put any public money into this and no good reason to support it. This is an extraordinary point of view. It's a position I argue against in the monograph. But above all, it results from the belief that for the vast bulk of the population, there should be no choice, that people can't judge what they want, that they can't decide that actually for both career and life enjoyment reasons, they want general education. It's not available to them. And the whole way in which further and adult education are forced to sign up to short-term contracts makes it almost impossible for them to maintain, let alone develop, a range of educational options for the population as a whole. So much of this monograph is a criticism of the current situation.
But I also suggest how we should move forward, both in the longer term and immediately. First of all, I point out how grossly unequal, not only in terms of choice, but in terms of resources, our post-compulsory system has become. We pour money into universities, we starve everything else. Over the long term, we must try and equalise this. It is grossly unjust and it's really something that should be much more visible and it's a disgrace that more people are not campaigning for it and are not aware of how unequal this situation is. So over time we should, for example, to give one concrete example, make it possible for an adult who wants to do an apprenticeship to gain the same support as a 19-year-old doing an undergraduate degree. They should have the same access to loans, the same access to support through, for example, the student loan company for anything that is post-compulsory, substantial, serious. Much more immediately, we can and should put money and into people's own pockets. In other words, if we're going to put money into further education and training, give it to individuals. Let them decide what they want. They are the ones who know what is good for them. They are the ones who know what will motivate them and what they will therefore work at. And if we go to something which would actually be very simple to do, namely a learning account system in which, for example, the government matches. I put in £10, the government puts in £10. I put in £10, maybe the government puts in 5 or 15 depending on my circumstances. But I pay something towards it, so I'm really motivated to think about it. The government puts its subsidy in my hands, not in the hands of somebody who signs a contract to shovel out worthless qualifications. And we actually shift demand to where it should be, coming through individuals into the marketplace, following what they want, what they know is good for them, what they are motivated to do. And it's not that hard. There is out there at the moment a splendid organisation called the Charities Aid Foundation, which operates on just this principle. I put in some money, it matches. We could do this very easily tomorrow. And in my opinion, we should. So if the government were to uh, match funds, how would you control it? I think you have to start by piloting it to see how great the demand is. There's always this worry that if you offer a, an open-ended subsidy, you'll suddenly discover that it runs away with you. And you then have two choices. You either do first come, first served, and when the money runs out, it stops. Which, by the way, we do very often. I mean, we've been doing it recently with, um, you know, clunkers for cash, you know, dump your car and get a new one. But... Actually, it's something where once you've started a scheme, you can usually gauge quite well what the demand will be. So the obvious thing to do is to run a couple of pilots, do them with different matching rates, see what the demand is, and then you can fine tune it. Because obviously, the lower the matching rate, the lower the demand is going to be. People love things for free. If they have to contribute something, they think harder about it. And you do it that way. You'll be able to predict your expenditure just as accurately as we do most bits of government expenditure. We're constantly told there is a market failure in training. Is it therefore right that the government subsidises companies? We are indeed constantly told this, and it's based on a theoretical argument. But in fact, we've now got a large amount of empirical evidence which suggests that actually there is no huge shortfall in the amount of relevant training that companies provide. And of course, companies are in the business of providing training for their own concerns. They're not general education institutions. There's... There are two things I think that one also needs to say. First of all, even if there were hypothetically some market failure, are we making things better by intervening wholesale or are we likely to be making things worse? And given the dismal evidence on the returns to the government's policies, one has to conclude that it's far more likely we're making things worse than we're making things better. But there is one other issue, which is apprenticeship. And that, I think, is a very important part of any country's education system. But what one has to remember is that it is essentially part of education. Just as, by definition, you don't produce exactly the right number of English graduates for exactly the number of people who are going to teach English in university, just as lots of lawyers didn't do law as their first degree and so forth. It's really important to think about apprenticeship as educating people in such a way that you not only are likely to get but should expect to get 
more people qualified for a given area than will actually make a lifetime career in it. And the fact that basically it's part of education and the fact that, again, if we're not going to turn ourselves into a slave society, (laughs) that somebody who does an apprenticeship with a company may not go on working with them. Those two things mean that there's a perfectly valid case for subsidising employers to train apprentices. But we have to be really clear, what we're arguing for here is that part of our education system is done best in the workplace. And if employers are being paid to educate, then they should be paid for it. That's a very different thing from taking your big retailers, your big fast food outlets and saying, hey, let's pay for your initial training for you.